Hello, welcome to Robin LSL's 2021 gaming retrospective. Now I am like you, everyone watching this video, I'm a gamer. Games are something which mattered to me and I enjoy playing them a lot. And you know, all kinds of different games, well, all kinds, we'll see what kinds really. And I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, talk about it a lot with my friends. And this whole thing means a lot. And I've had this idea, it's not the first day I have the idea, but it's the first time I actually do it, to kind of create some kind of video explaining what I went through, the games I went through, what I thought about them, what I felt, how I liked them, and so on. Now, now I'm not really a big video creator, even though I'd like to be, so I don't quite have the skills to do a fanciful top five best, top five worst, top five blandest, and things like that. But I have enough skills to use this website, tiermaker.com. And I made myself a little custom tier list. So what do we have? The games I've played in 2021, more like the games I have seriously started in that year, at least. Like, you know, there's a few tiny things which I didn't play that we don't need to, that I did play, but not so much that we don't need to worry about at all here. And I'm going to sort them into four categories. Now, okay, disclaimer, this is a very personal thing. These are not going to be objective reviews, even though I like my opinions to be objective facts. It's not always the case. You will see that it's not always the case. And instead, these categories are really how much I like those games and how much they ended up mattering to me. So in top tier, we have what I call real standouts. These are games which I just thought were really amazing. No, doesn't mean perfect or masterpiece, but somehow they impressed me. And they impressed me so much that and I feel they're now important to me and I might talk about them with friends who are in gaming much more than whatever we'll see later on. I might have played some of them with friends or share the playing experience and so on. And overall, you know, something which matters and had a pretty good influence on me. Next is just games I liked, like solid experiences, had a good time playing, but somehow not transcendental just might still be something I recommend, but it doesn't end up being a big deal whether, you know, whether I recommend it or whether someone plays it or not, at least no, to me. Then we have somewhat okay status. So the games I kind of liked, but there was something really preventing me from actually properly enjoying it. Like uh, maybe one big flaw or a lot of small flaws, or game is just a bit bland. Bland can be the worst crime against humanity. Not bad, bland. And uh, final category, called it Let It Be Forgotten, just to be a little bit fanciful, just games I didn't like. That, again, that doesn't mean they're actually bad experience, bad games, but I, I had a bad time with them. Other people might have a good time, but for me, it felt that something was wrong and it just really got in the way of actually me getting into the game. Okay, and with that, let me just read the names of all the games I played. They're actually in chrono chronological order as best as I can remember. I did go through my Nintendo and Steam receipts to actually uh, sort them out. So Hades, Mario 3D World with Barrows of Fury, Had in Time, Breath of the Fall 2, Link's Awakening Remake, Gris, Hotline Miami Collection, Twilight Refrain, It Takes Two. Weird game in this list, like the only Western AAA game, here it is. Unconnected Marketeers, The Escapists 2, Ace Attorney Chronicles, Cross Code, Axiom Verge 2, the three Castlevania Advance games. So, Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance, Aria of Sorrow, Metroid Dread, Neo, The World Ends With You, and Astalon, Tears of the Earth. All right, let's go. First, we have Hades. So, Hades, Hades, Hades. That one was a contender for Game of the Year, I think. And that may inform, you know, what you might guess to be my decision. And you'd be right, it's a freaking awesome game. Yes, indeed. So, uh, Hades, for those who don't know, it's an action game. 
but uh, action roguelite. So basically take Binding of Isaac, but replace the combat with uh, more more actiony, weapony things. You know, with your various weapons: sword, bow, spear, and whatever. You get to dash around a lot. It's uh, it's more active, and very fun gameplay overall. And the setting is absolutely incredible. Setting and presentation are really wonderfully done. So it's set, uh, you know, in the age of the Greek gods. You play as uh, Hades' son, trying to escape from the underworld, and uh, the, whole, the whole thing is properly brilliant. I, I will say. And nothing is perfect. Hades, at some point, I felt that I was done with it. Like, uh, you know, umpteen runs into it. I was like, okay, I've had enough. Which is something I haven't felt with Binding of Isaac. Despite Binding of Isaac being simpler, you know, this game, uh, Hades, at some point, I just felt I was done with it. Binding of Isaac does have this whole constant, constant, constant unlocking we have and uh, which is a bit more missing from Hades. At some point I asked myself, why exactly am I playing? Not quite sure. But maybe Isaac just has too much bloat. Debatable. On that topic, I'm not putting repentance, uh, Isaac repentance on this, because it's really just more of something we already had. So it doesn't quite count. Super Mario 3D World and Bowser's Fury. Now that's technically two games. So 3D World's a remake of the Wii U game. Bowser's Fury is something new, but as it turns out, they're both top tier, real standouts, and you know for their own reasons, because they're properly different games. Mario 3D World is just an incredibly well crafted, you know, you could say standard as it's it's a 2D Mario experience, but in 3D, and it works so well. To be fair, sometimes perspective kind of tricks you but the cat suit really helps alleviate that overall the thing is just so fun it's you have well crafted each level has something really interesting to say and to make you do it, it just feels great fun fact i played a lot of that game with the joy con drift except the final level i figured okay that's enough i need something without drift that's you know, same day a pro controller ordered a ride. Bowser's Fury is a completely different game. It's not a 2D Mario experience, it's more of a 3D Mario experience, despite not having 3D in the title. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a mix of various uh, Mario games. So a bit of Mario 64, Odyssey, because of the whole collectathon, collectathon uh, thing, where you go through your levels looking for stuff, mostly cat shines, but it's, in a whole open world thing, which is just incredible. The game just flows into itself constantly. You find a shine, then you move a bit, and there's something to do, and there's a new shine, you move a bit, blah, 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 blah. You never get lost, because the whole thing is actually quite small and packed. And uh, the whole way, the way everything is integrated is really marvelous. And uh, you just move from place to place. It's always something fun to do and you'll get your reward, which is a cat shine. I actually feel it's quite close to Banjo-Kazooie, a game I'm replaying right now, on the, also on the Switch, because of the fact that the levels are quite compact and you can easily find stuff to do all the time. And so, you no, know, it's not perfect. The whole Fury mechanic for Bowser is a bit wonky, kind of forces you to do things you don't really want to do at times, which is a bit annoying, but and uh, and I'll add the final normal level, which is called like something Roiling Roller Island, is pretty bad because it's easy to die, and it's like the only one of the only levels with a proper lava pit which kills you. And dying in this game very rarely happens, but it breaks the flow because for some reason the the game needs to reload itself completely. Like the whole game just flows without loading times, except when you die and everything stops for 50 seconds. Feels terrible. But you know, that's a blip inside this incredibly good feeling thing. Okay, oh, and the music for both of them, for 3D World and Bowser's Fury is excellent. Again, so well made, so well crafted. Remixes constantly being 
you know, one tune being remixed into another theme. So, so great. Uh, next is a hat in time. So this one, it's kind of a borderline between two categories. You've seen me play, you've seen me play it, and you've seen me had a good time, have a really good time with it. It's not perfect, especially technically, it's kind of missing out on uh, just not quite optimized well, and camera eh, 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 at times. And I should say, I should say, should describe the game. It's a more traditional 3D platformer collectathon. So while Bowser's Fury was very modern, they really used that open world setting. Had in Time is closer to, I guess, Banjo Tooie, Donkey Kong 64. The world's really big. It does use a mission structure like Mario 64. But uh, the worlds are really big. They are packed with quite a lot of things to find also. But you know, it feels a little bit less competent than something like 3D World or Bowser's Fury. But it has a lot of heart. I thought it has a lot of heart. It's a very cute game, fun to look at. I, the soundtrack is okay, but has this weird flaw that there's this one tune which overshadows the rest of the whole game. For me, that was... Uh, train wreck of Electro Swing. Amazing song. And I'm gonna put it in real standout, but it it's kind of, you know, high there or low there. And uh, I want to be nice, so I'm gonna put it low there. Okay, next is Bravely Default 2. So, completely different style of game. This is a quite traditional Japanese RPG, turn-based battles, uh, class, jo classes, jobs, leveling up, all this good stuff. Four crystals. Does it have four crystals? Yeah, it does have four crystals. Warriors of Light, and so on. Uh, I will surprise a lot of people, I think, but I'm putting it here. I did not like this game. Which is curious, because I really liked the first one, Bravely Second, uh, Bravely Default. And I actually like the second one, which is called Bravely Second. This is the third game in a series. Yes, not really, because something really... This series suffered. This series suffered immensely at something quite unfortunate. So the second game, Bravely Second, it had got a terrible reputation in Japan because they took one terrible decision, which is each side quest you get to pick sides, like two, two, two people are fighting and you have to choose which one you'll support. And the result is that every time when you finish a side quest, it ends up badly for at least one person. And people hated that. And despite this game having some kind of time rewinding mechanics, so you can play the side quest twice to see both sides, there was no way of actually satisfying everyone at the end. And people hated that in Japan. And, and so, when Bravely Second got released in the US, they kind of changed things and added good endings to the side quests. Unfortunately, that was enough to tank that game's reputation, which means when they wanted to do another sequel, they decided to kind of scrap the past and do another game kind of based on the same ideas. But to me, that didn't go well. Well, let me tell you maybe what went well first. The mechanics are still good. It's still using the Brave and Default system when you can skip turns or rather save turns and unleash them later. It's changed a bit in a way which is fine in that instead of being a strict turn base, it's actually what we'd call turn order. So if you have a high speed stat, your turns will come back faster. So that enables for different kinds of strategies. I won't say better or worse, I've never felt that but different kinds. What maybe things I didn't quite like on the mechanical side is that uh, it's too easy to max out individual jobs, which means you kind of end up maxing jobs and then leaving them and going to new ones throughout the whole game. It kind of feels that you're not using all the tools you'd be wanting to be using. Something I felt. Again, personal opinion, I can see why someone would disagree with that, and that's fine. Uh, in any case, that's the good thing about the game, is that mechanically, the whole RPG fighting, team building, spells, jobs, and so on, it's still clean and good. Now, what I didn't like, well, first, in some ways, 
you know, the, this game is a bit zero steps forward, one step back compared to, say, Bravely Second. Uh, I thought the jobs were a bit too simplistic. I can't quite remember it. I felt I liked the jobs in the previous game better. Let, yeah, let's say it this way. The jobs in the previous game were really more interesting and unusual. They especially they had like the spellcraft uh, skill, which lets you combine spells with funny effects. Not funny, interesting effects, which gave magic quite a lot of depth. So I will say that. So that's like one step back. Another step back is that they removed these very unusual but fun quality of life things where you can disable random battles or increase the, the rate, the rate of random battles. And let, letting you completely customize your RPG experience depending on your mood at the time. And I love that. They replaced it by what's now traditional monsters are on the map. Just walk around them and walk into them if you want to fight and avoid walking into them if you don't want to fight, which may be difficult given that they're, they're moving as, as well. So that's the not quite as good thing. One thing which is decent but also not quite as good is the music. So the music in Brave to the Fool the First, composed by Revo, is absolutely amazing. One, one of my very favorite video game soundtracks of all time. Listen to it, even if you haven't played it, almost, to be honest. This guy has immense, immense emotional power in whatever he wrote. And you can feel it. Everything is so strong, you know, harmonically, rhythmically, me melodically. It just works and it takes you. Second game, very second, they went completely the other way. So a different composer, Rio, I think. She, I don't know, like she wrote a song, which I love. Uh, the first ending from the Bake Monogatari anime series. But... That soundtrack, the new pieces, because they kept pieces from the original, were just bad, didn't work, were really missing what's core and interesting in music. And for this one, they brought back the original composer, Revo, but he didn't manage to capture the thing he captured in the first game. Still reasonably okay, but somehow melodies aren't as catchy anymore. Anything, nothing is as catchy anymore in what he wrote. Mm. So much talking, so much talking. So music is a letdown, but the real letdown, the real letdown in Bravely Default 2 is the story, characters, and writing. I, I just thought it was dreadful. The characters are all terrible. They're flat, flat as a mat. They all fit under my door. It's uh, all of them together, except Elvis would fit under my door. The characters are not, not interesting. I've forgotten most of the names. Seth is the main character who barely talks. Gloria is your typical princess who's in charge of finding those crystals. Elvis is the only character who feels like he exists and he's pretty fun. He, he, his energy drives the whole game. He doesn't drive the plot. He's not so important to the plot. And the fourth character, forgot her name. Yeah, didn't, she didn't catch me either. She's better than Seth and Gloria. But all the other characters you meet in the game are just as bad. The story beats are incredibly predictable and boring. Um, ah, it's To me, it felt like a slog because I just was not interested. And eventually I gave up. I start, stopped playing this game like 30 hours in. Which, you know, is a shame. I kind of want to know how it ends, but not enough to actually play it. Yeah, I mean, I could go through details of each chapter, why it's so boring and predictable, but uh, I'm not going to do that. It was, uh. But, oh, one other good thing about this game, it has a great card game, you know, mini game in it. Uh, you know, RPGs tend to do that ever since Final Fantasy VIII did it. And, yeah, and here it's really good, really solid card game. Finally, I'll add, it's really badly optimized on the... Uh, <coughs> actually video game running things so it probably suffered from covid and people not having time to program things well but ugh, there's like loads of random stops whenever someone has to speak the game will freeze for a second things like that just gets on my nerves i'm uh, i'm a bit demanding and you know square enix made that they're a big studio they they should be able to do this properly so yeah 
a few a few weird glitches, a few crashes, not so fun. Forget if it auto saves or not, but yeah. Bravely default two, you disappointed me. I had good expectations. Oh, also another bad. So obviously it has HD graphics, but the problem is that the art style so seemingly worked well for the previous game on the 3DS. But the chibi, weirdly sized characters in HD, they look really weird, especially the king in the first town. Ugh, so strange. Okay, next we have Zelda Link's Awakening. As you know, I'm a big, big, big fan of the original. However, I'm not quite as big of a fan of that one. So it's, it's a bit of a nitpick. I think they did something which artistically absolutely works. Absolutely works. Actually, the more I think about it, it, it really does feel like a natural progression from the original. I kind of still prefer the original style slightly. But that's not why this game is only in the liked category. The reason I didn't quite love it is that gameplay wise, it felt like a step down. Link's movement isn't as good as in the original. And uh, it's been like half a year since I played that even more. But the movement feels like maybe a little bit floaty. Something doesn't quite work. And that's a little bit of a shame. You're a bit slow movement, yeah, so I just said it. I can't quite remember. You would be able to find video reviews saying this in more detail. So when I finished it, I looked at video reviews and people said what I was thinking. Movement, not quite there. And movement is so important in any video game. Video game has to feel good to play. And Zelda game, whether you like it or not, has a good element of action. So you need, you need movement to feel good. Uh, but they nailed the art style. Music, the rem remixes are good. Nothing, nothing against that. Love the original still, but those are good. I'll say the things they added to the game, <coughs> it's debatable whether they're good or not. There's loads more seashells. There's a kind of slightly interesting thing where when you find, so at, at, this, at first the seashells are mostly where you expect them to be from the original. But eventually you find something like the seashell finder, something like that. And then you re realize there's three times more. It's three times as many seashells in the original. But now you have this item which helps you find them. So that actually works. Even though a few of them are kind of weirdly hidden. And the whole dungeon crafting minigame, I never really uh, interacted with it much. But it kind of sucks that that has some heart pieces and maybe also seashells behind it. Oh well, still still a good game for the for artistic reasons. Talking about artistic reasons, next we have Gris. That plays like a 2D platformer. But uh, again, it's it's slow. This is definitely not a dexterity based game. You can't really die or anything like that. And the way I see it, it's really just look at the interesting world you offered and go through it at a leisurely pace and enjoying it the whole way. It's, you know, mechanically, it offers nothing particularly interesting, but it's, it's probably beautiful. I'll give it that. Next, Hotline Miami. Now those, so that's got collection with two games. Uh, so made by Devolver, published by Devolver, just like Gris, actually. I bought those around the same time because there was a Devolver sale. Hotline Miami is more of a twin stick shooter. But not always shooting because you can punch and punching is useful. And it's a very, very twitch based game where you die. Everything dies in exactly one hit, I think. And it actually has a really, really interesting and strangely presented story. I, I like this a lot. I like this a lot. It's, it's kind of too small to end up being a real standout. But uh, no, I played it for a few days and uh, I had a hell of a fun time. It gets a bit frustrating at times because you die in one hit, so you can't, uh, so, you know, any small mistake hurts you. And twin stick, I'm not a big, I'm not big on the whole twin stick thing. On the, uh, if you play, I played it on the Switch, if you play it on the PC, you'd use the mouse to aim. That would probably be a bit easier. On the Switch, you end up using both directions and sometimes auto aim feature. 
So that can be a little bit weird at times. Uh, Twilight Refrain. I didn't play this for much, but it's a solid shmup and it works. And it seems to have interesting paths, so we'll stay at that. And you know, my I used to be a big shmup sh uh, player 10 years ago. Nowadays I play them less. I find the fact that I need to practice to reach the good endings. You've seen me. I, I want to play those games. I, I can't quite gather the motivation to practice. But, you know, I'll probably get back to it, just like I will go back to a bunch of Toho games. Next is It Takes Two. As I mentioned, this is like the only Western AAA game on this list. I don't really play Western AAA games. Not entirely for good reasons, but uh, often they don't quite appeal to me, but I should try more. In any case, It Takes Two is special because it takes two people to play it. Ha! Play as a couple. What's their name? Forgot their name. It's not Mary. Forgot their name. Uh, you know what? We can Google this. We can Google this. Uh, da, da, da. I'll do it on my side screen. It takes two. Cody and May. I remembered. Ha! You know, this is what happens. As soon as you Google it or you ask something, someone tells you it's it's a three D action platformer. Th where you play with two players who have very uh, dissymmetric roles. One of them is Cody, a guy, the other is May, a woman, and you know they're trying to fix their relationship, eh, kind of, they've been transformed into toys by their crying daughter who sees that they don't like each other anymore, blah, blah, blah. Uh, good story and solid game. I just felt, it's hard to explain, but I felt that um, the game was playing itself too much and uh, it's hard to give a <clears throat> proper explanation for this feeling but it was there everything worked and uh, on occasion i did a thing or two which i found good as in uh found you know i thought yeah i solved the puzzle that was interesting but really i think in the end it's actually quite simple and uh the game is beautiful, music is probably okay, don't quite remember, but a little bit, it's weird because it's not bland at all, but somehow it feels a little bit uh, forgettable still in my head. Even though it's really well made, well crafted, and it uses the two player aspect really well. So you can see there's a bit of dissonance in my head, but you know, personal feelings don't quite have to make sense. What's special is that I played this with a friend. You know, maybe that also distracts me uh, from whatever feelings I had. So I go, this goes into good game, good time, but doesn't quite make it. <coughs> the voice is so dry. Mm -hmm. Toho 18, Unconnected Marketeers. Same thing as Twilight Refrain. Clearly, it works as a shmup. But I'm, I can't take it super high because I'm not able to just invest myself into it. The Escapists 2. Uh, fun times. This is a kind of... It's not open world. Couldn't say open world. It's an open game where you set, you're set up in a prison. Well, each stage you can play is a prison. You're in it and you have to escape it. And... The whole game is very open in the way you can explore around and make it work. You know, the prison has multiple possible exits and you have to craft items and steal keys from the guards and, and things like that to actually find them. And uh, it's all good fun. I play this with a friend and I, I notice and it in some ways it's a bit frustrating that he's better at the game than me. And I'm always kind of slightly lagging behind trying to find out how we do something, find the exit and so on. Now it is completely cooperative, co cooperative game, gameplay. So whenever my friend has an idea, I can support him on that and craft some items and so on. But there's a slightly frustrating feeling that I want to get better <coughs> at it. It's, uh, it's really fun. It gets slow at times as you're kind of trying to figure out what the hell you're supposed to do or you're stuck in somewhere because you beat up too many guards and so on. 
but there's something about discovering the exit um, finding the moment where you where you can make things work and then making them work which feels really good solid game ace attorney chronicles i'm gonna surprise quite a few people here again i'm a big fan of phoenix wright ace attorney especially the first three i think they're brilliant games especially no double especially the third which is mm, super strong experience but this one yeah nope 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 it didn't it didn't quite grab me and i blame this on one main thing which is that it's incredibly slow <clears throat> oh my god this game goes at a snail space specifically people just talk too much and i wonder if it's some kind of uh thing which is happening with modern you know, plot-based games, uh, some RPGs and things like that. Because, oh, it just feels that things are going nowhere. I'm not quite a fan of the characters either. So, um, yeah, the main character, Naruhodo Ryunosuke, is, he's a little bit just there compared to Phoenix. Fe Phoenix Wright was a bit more fun. He was uh, a bit too much the butt of everyone's jokes, but his inner inner voice was so snarky. That was pretty fun. Uh, so, yeah, Naruhodo is okay. Uh, his friend, uh, Susato, is good. She's quite good. She's quite fun. And then you have a Herlock Sholmes. Herlock Sholmes, he's, uh, he's not so good. <clears throat> he's ridiculous for the sake of being ridiculous a bit too much, I think. And uh, Watson, I forgot her name, Watson in that game uh, is a little girl who has a PhD in medicine because why not? And writes novels as well. She, um, she, nah, nah, a little bit too generic. <coughs> so yeah, like the whole concept, the whole Ace Attorney formula works. It's still there, but this game is just so damn slow. It's actually two games which I've been combined in this collection, but mm. um, I'm currently at the second case of the second game and I uh, haven't played in a few months. I haven't officially dropped it, unlike Bravely Default 2, but will I actually come back to it? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not quite certain. And yeah, so it's super slow. The cases are not too interesting either. So out of those I've played, the first, the first two in the first game, just they both are tutorial and way too slow. The fourth case is also just felt really dumb. It just felt really dumb and useless, really. Yes, I'm saying big words, but that's how I felt. So yeah, this game doesn't cut, doesn't cut it compared to the real core Ace Attorney games. <clears throat> Next, we have CrossCode, a game I played a few years late. I think it came out in like 2018. CrossCode is many things. It's a bit of an homage to late 90s RPGs, I would say, with the it's very action RPG, kind of reminds me of Secret of Mana, but much more modern. It has loads of puzzles. And apparently that reminds, that's inspired by Alundra. That's how you pronounce it. That was a PlayStation 1 game. And it also has a story, which is more modern, based on uh, people, you know, people playing an MMO. Well, MMO, yeah, but uh, it's a very much, it's a full immersion MMO, where it's not virtual reality, it's like you build fake bodies on a real planet somewhere far away from where you are. And <clears throat> that's that basically describes CrossCode. I will add a bit of uh, exploring and uh, weird but slightly fun platforming in your whole 2D RPG environment. And that game is freaking amazing. I say it. I'm going to leave Hat in Time to the right just to say that it's borderline. Even though those things aren't really sorted, 
I don't want to say that I have a favorite game or anything like that. <clears throat> Hand in Time is a bit borderline. Crosscode is an indie game, like Hand in Time, so it's a small team which made it. But Crosscode <coughs> is really, really good. And everything about it, I, f I thought, was excellent. Is that true? Maybe that's not quite true, but uh, the story... I really loved the story and characters and so many moments felt so real. I, I'm having tears coming to my eyes, just thinking of, again about a few things which happened. And mm, those a very strong emotional story. You'd be surprised. You would be surprised. The combat gameplay is good and fun. It's solid fun. It's not an easy game. It's not super hard either. If you really want to abuse all the items, consumable items, potions, what sandwiches, and so on, you really can. It will help. But uh, you know, each boss is a solid challenge. The random, well, they're not quite random. The non-boss encounters felt a little bit useless slash grindy, but they made the grinding interesting because you're really looking for specific items, especially endgame. That worked quite well. And uh, puzzles, there's loads of puzzles. They're often quite difficult or very difficult, but they can make you feel good, you know, when you get that aha moment and you find the answer. That's really good. But some of them felt a little bit too obtuse at times. I think one puzzle I solved by a glitch, like a non-intended method, which was pretty funny. And once or twice, I did have to look, for, look in a guide to my great shame. And uh, also, I guess, so the slightly less good thing about this game is the music. Music is good. Well, it's, it's not bad. The music stays at the not bad level. It's nothing like, say, Super Domana. And uh, the game also has those weird ex exploration platforming puzzles, which there's actually a lot of it in the game, and a lot of it is sometimes referenced by the characters. Oh, this is something the setting does really well. It's characters talking about the MMO they're playing inside the game. I thought that was really funny and really well made. So kudos for that as well, as part of the whole story setting characters thing. But those, yeah, those platforming puzzles to find chests on the map, they're a little bit too much of them. And for those who played it in the desert, I mostly gave up just for the desert uh, region because I just wasn't able to find it. Well, that's okay. The Crosscode, brilliant game. Possibly, like, if I really had to choose a favorite, this would be a contender. Yes. Next is Axiom Verge 2. Axiom Verge 2 sequel to Axiom Verge, which was a really interesting Metroidvania from 2017, I want to say. I think I played it in 2018 on the Switch, and it came slightly before that. Came out something before that. Action Verge 2 is a sequel to that, but it's a very different game. The weird thing in Action Verge 2, Axiom Verge 2, there's barely any combat in it. You can combat is mostly optional, and that's not quite true. But I mean, there's an actual slider where you can turn enemy aggression off. But also, all the bosses are optional. There's like bosses hanging out on the map, not doing anything, and it does feel like you're kind of exploring for no good reason because combat is not a very important part in this game. <clears throat> we, and you know, that could be the main flaw. But <clears throat> what I will say is that it captured the Metroidvania spirit of exploring really well. And after the first half hour, which was so-so, I felt that things were opening. And the next two or three hours after that just felt really good to explore and play around with. And I was having this really good, this feels great Metroidvania feeling, which if you nail that, you know you got something right. It's not as good as the original. And the weird de-emphasis de on fighting is, seems strange seeing how the game is built, but it's still a solid game made by Mr. Tom Hack, who really has interesting ideas. Yes, indeed. Okay, next we have three games. <coughs> Castlevania Advanced Collection has Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance, and Aria of Sorrow. 
I'm going to surprise people a little bit. I'm going to say I liked Circle of the Moon. I did not like Harmony of Dissonance. And Aria of Sorrow is borderline, but just so that I can really make them different, I'm going to put it in the OK category. So what do we have here? Circle of the Moon first. So these, well, maybe talk about the them. The three are Metroidvanias. So they're very much the successors to uh, Symphony of the Night. But they all do it differently. And that's good. We like difference. But let's see how, how it made me like them more or less. So Circle of the Moon actually has a lot of classic Vania DNA. You don't have to explore that much. A lot of it can feel like there's a big-ish central area and then side areas you go to. <clears throat> and every time you finish the side area, this basically unlocks the next main level. And the main level's being reasonably linear. And it feels a little bit like that. I'm slightly exaggerating, but not that much. But it still feels good. I think that's because the design within each area is actually solid and strong. And there's still loads of small secrets to find. Like you can break random walls and find health ups or mana ups or whatever. And I like that. And I like the solid classic Venya design within each section. I've just had a good time playing those. The Circle of the Moon, you know, it has a lot of weird stuff going in it. The whole card and magic system is just strange and strangely random and un not practical to use at all for a beginner. But, but whatever, you can still just play the game and figure out what you can and mostly have a good time. The music in that one is very good. But for a slightly eh reason is that there's a lot of remixes from previous games and we know Castlevania music rocks. Next is Harmony of Dissonance. <coughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating the, bad, the badness of this one and the next one as well. But certainly the one I liked less, the least of this lot. It, uh, it's just a bit eh. It's just a bit eh. Very easy game gives you way too many health items. Uh, music is not not good. So the composer actually apologized officially and uh, the reason for that was they had to they tried to cram so much stuff into the game that the, for the music they had to use a really really low quality samples. But I don't really remember much of the game. There was one annoying song. I think it's in the treasury. It's it's okay, but came back a bit too much, I think. But there's one properly interesting piece of music. And that's kind of the theme you hear the main main section, which is supposed to be the theme of the main character, Juste de Belmont, who does not look like a Belmont at all. Look at him. He's he looks like Alucard. This guy looks like Alucard, but he's a Belmont. Who knows? Who knows? Also, does he use whips? Not sure. Maybe so. Well, you, in any case, it's a game where you can change your equipment. Yeah, all these Metroidvanias, like the ones which are Castlevanias, they have this whole leveling up and experience and equipment system which just feels unnecessary. It adds bloat to what is basically an action and exploration game. I don't really see the point. Though level ups heal you, which is slightly interesting, but the whole, you found a better sword, now go in a menu and equip it, just feels completely a bit like a waste of time. But back to Harmony of Dissonance, it, it tries, it really tries at being the next uh, Symphony of the Night, unlike Circle of the Moon, which tried to be its own thing and was in some sense less ambitious. But Harmony of Dissonance ends up having this kind of dual world mechanic, which is actually used in Axiom Verge 2 very well. But in Harmony of Dissonance, it's not used very well. And you end up going through most areas twice, but for no particular good reason, because you don't get a super interesting reward the next time. So that feels... It's a bit frustrating, and sometimes you can just feel the frustration when you're going through a set of rooms for basically no reason. You're not exactly exploring, because there's two castles, they're the same, <coughs> almost. So you know what you're going through. Not necessarily a fun time. And next we have Aria of Sorrow. The 
probably objectively the best one of the lot. Like that one's doesn't have the double castle thing. It's just a clean explore Dracula's castle, have fun and find new abilities. And it does that quite well. It uses the souls mechanic where you absorb souls of monsters to grant you the abilities, which is quite fun. And it the whole thing works. It just felt a little bit a little bit bland, just do the things as they go along kind of experience, <coughs> which we don't quite want. It was also quite easy. The, those two are quite easy, unlike Circle of the Moon, which is hard. And actually, uh, Ariel Sorrow, I felt at some point like physical frustration playing and not quite sure why, but you know, there's this thing, feeling sometimes when you're back, lower back, things kind of tingle in an annoying way from frustration. I don't quite get it, but I had it during Aria of Sorrow and that probably tarnishes my whole representation of the game. It's it's a good game. Like if I was being unbiased, I would put it up here, but I am biased and I like three Castlevania games to be in different categories. Sue me if you want to. Metroid Dread. Do I need to talk about this? I don't need to talk about this. It's brilliant. It's an excellent revival of the Metroid franchise. It's not perfect at all. Well, at all is a bit strong, but it's it's a very good game. Bosses are fun and uh, you know, they make you learn them as you play. Just fight, grind, grind, grind. At some point, boom, it kind of uh, clicks inside your brain. So it's not boom, it's a click. And all of a sudden, you know how to beat the boss. That feels quite good. Mercury's team really improved whatever they did on with their Samus Returns to end up making a solid game. It has so many things, but uh, let me think what I want to say. It feels very good to play and control Samus. So fluid, it's great. Uh, the bosses are great. Combat, so that's the two things. Combat, in general, regular enemies not so great because you can always just do the parry and one-shot them thing which is not so fun. Exploration feels good. That depends. Uh, the game is so well designed that depending on where you are in your mind, you'll notice very different things. So this game, no, so it's a Metroidvania. So you have to explore the map looking for your next upgrade, which will able, enable you to explore more of the map and find the next upgrade and so on. But the developers, Mercury Steam, were very good at railroading you without making it too obvious. Or did they? So they actually, so yeah, they're quite good at railroading you. So whenever you find a new item, it's quite easy to find where you have to use it. But depending on like your level of awareness, you will notice it or you won't. And if you don't notice it, it feels great. It feels like you're exploring the thing and it's really organic and you're getting what you want. And it's going fast and so on. Well, to be fair, if you're not quite super aware, you, you will actually get lost and not figure out where you want to go. This happens. But if you're super experienced, you will actually see the developer's hand almost literally forcing you to go to various places. And at some point you're, th you're starting to think, wait, is this game secretly linear? So yeah, if you feel that it's obvious where you have to go every time, all of a sudden you're not quite exploring anymore. But when you reach this state, you realize the developers have actually put some sequence breaks in the game on purpose, alternate paths, which uh, make, you things get, make you get items out of order. And it's so well designed at that stage. That's really incredible. And so it kind of loops back to, indeed, it is free, free form exploration. Not quite free form, but no way as limited as you might thought. You might have thought it was. It works so well. I did a second run of the game as soon as I finished it. And I stopped there, but I will probably do a third run soon enough. Uh, what else? The story is kind of... Eh. I, I like my Metroid games to just not have any story in the middle. So like Metroid Prime 1, Super Metroid, that's that's where, that's how it really gets me. Uh, controls, so while Samus is super fluid, 
there's just way too many buttons to press. And at some points it can feel like your hand is cramping because you're holding like various things to enable various effects. And that's that's a bit eh, a bit annoying. But uh, brilliant game. I'm not quite sure about the soundtrack yet. So general consensus is that when you're play, playing and listen to it, it feels bad. But I think there's actually a, a high amount of uh, quality craftsmanship in it. So I need to listen to that and give it some more chance. Okay, Neo, The World Ends With You, another JRPG, that's a sequel, sequel to The World Ends With You. This game uh, is cursed by having a terrible title and terrible promotion. A lot of people didn't know it came out, and a lot of people who saw that thought it was just another re-release of the first game. It's not, it's a new game, and the result is that it had very disappointing sales which is uh, a shame, especially nowadays where initial sales matter a lot and then the game drops in price immediately. Ah. I, <clears throat> I haven't given it enough of a try yet, but I didn't love it. So it has the same premise, STEM style of premise as the first game where uh, a few youngsters are thrown into an alternate version of Shibuya in Tokyo where it turns out they're dead and they have to follow objectives and fight monsters throughout the day to survive and so on. Fun stuff. <coughs> Fun stuff. But uh, it, it didn't quite capture me. I'll, I'll say the characters are okay. They're not bad. But the way the story is presented in kind of a picture book format where the picture of uh, someone, the person who's talking appears, on one side of the screen and the dialogue and then a picture with someone else appears somewhere else. Sometimes like that and sometimes it's more traditional, just everyone has their portrait on the screen and they will light up whoever's talking. Uh, that that felt like it could have benef could have benefited from like more something more more exciting presentation to make it more dynamic. Game feels a bit slow. Overall, I think it's a bit slow. It feels very, very big. I've played it like maybe 10, 15 hours, 15 hours. But uh, I don't think I've actually completed that much of it. Fighting is very, very strange. And <coughs> I think not quite controllable. You control one character at a time from your team and make them use their attack and possibly dodge. And when they're out of uh, charges, they, they need to recharge and you switch to another character. It feels quite strange. Very easy at times, very hard at times. That's not good. That's not good design. It does, never quite feels that I'm probably in control of things. So, yeah, not, not a fan of the fighting. It's interesting. The game is super stylish in presentation. I surprisingly enjoy uh, grinding. In this game which doesn't happen all the time because you fight enemies get money and then buy food items in the shops and the food items are, are would boost your stats quite uh, quite unusual so that that's kind of fun but yeah i haven't been captivated by the story enough to push on but kind of like ace attorney i haven't dropped this officially it's just i'm playing other games which uh, excite me more. And last but not least, we have Astalon, Tears of the Earth. <clears throat> Another Metroidvania. I like those. I like those, even though I didn't like Harmony of Dissonance. It still has, at some point, this kind of good feeling of uh, I'm exploring, I'm not quite sure where I'm going. Well, that one, not much, <coughs> which is why it's here. But Astalon is a good game. Astalon is a good game. It's not a masterpiece. It's not the Metroidvania of the year, unlike uh, what some articles online would let, lead you to believe. But it's a solid game. You have three characters, and uh, you can swap, swap between them. They have different play styles. So melee swordsman, mid-range mage, and uh, long-range ranger, she's called, but she's, like, she uses a bow. And uh, each one of them, you know, the shorter your range, the more your DPS, higher attack speed and your damage, but the less safe you are. So it makes an interesting trade-off. Uh, and it has this roguelite element where when you die, you get to buy new upgrades. And then you start over from the beginning, but thankfully there's fast travel to some extent. 
The game is fun to play. Uh, you know, navigating. The exploring is not bad. De depends on the moment. It's very much, it's a bit too much key based rather than ability based. You don't unlock that many fun abilities throughout the game. And sometimes it will be just, you know, go to this part of the, of the tower, you're exploring a, ta a tower. And to find a key to open the door you just seen, you had seen before, which is fine, but uh, a bit too Zelda, not Metroid enough, if you you might say it this way. So most of the time, it doesn't quite feel that you're exploring, just that you're getting through stages. And the game is built as a succession of stages, like stage one is Golden's Tomb, stage two I forgot the name, stage three uh, stage two is Mechanism, stage three is Hall of Phantoms. And stage four is Tower of Ash, something like that. And after that's the Phantom, the final boss. But what is interesting is that <coughs> there's a whole optional path where you explore downwards the tower the game takes place in. And when I discovered the entrance to that place the first time, that wowed me. That properly wowed me. And I, at that moment, I had the Metroidvania feeling. Something I've been talking a few times today. I had the Metroidvania feeling where I'm exploring. I don't quite know where I'm going, but I'm unlocking interesting things. And that felt great. Uh, as far as the game goes, so the bosses are bad. The hardest boss is the first in the game. Ish. As in when you understand how it works, it's certainly not. But when you have the skills you have as a beginner player, the first boss will feel very hard and the second is also oh, the second boss is terribly designed it's just annoying as hell <clears throat> and all the others are really easy your stats climb up faster than the bosses basically I wasn't dying a lot but you know if you can farm a little bit you'll notice that so so yeah good time good feeling uh, one major flaw not quite sure how to describe that I chose to 100% this game not because I wanted to, but because that unlocked extra modes. So don't do that. Designers, don't do that. That sucks. And I really felt that the last 15 or so percent felt more like grinding, not fun grinding than anything else. And uh, at that time, when I was finishing my 100% run, I was like, ah, not good. Maybe this game isn't that good. And then I realized the point of the other two modes. I was like, hey, this is kind of fun. Three modes. There's three bonus modes. And they're all kind of fun, and I enjoyed them. And here we are. I've been talking for a whole hour. You know what? I should have put background music. If you, if you watch this video, add your own background music. I think that would be worth it. And uh, those are my games in 2021. Top five, I'd recommend. Not to anyone. Okay, Metroid Dread is difficult. Crosscode is difficult. <laughs> Hades is di oh, I like difficult games. Mario, do Mario. Mario had had time and not difficult. Metroid Dread is difficult but makes you learn. Kind of same for Crosscode. Hades, it's okay. It's difficult but the way progression happens is fine. <clears throat> but uh, these are wonderful games for me. These were good but uh, probably slightly forgettable though Gris is a great recommendation if you want to recommend a game to a non-gamer and it takes two as well but you need a powerful machine to play that <coughs> and everything else is kind of uh, forgettable I guess on the low, on the low end of things uh, there you go I think I hope I don't think but I hope this was entertaining and uh, you know if you have any thoughts or opinions do leave a comment. I'd be interesting, interested in hearing what anyone thinks. And, you know, if you're a real life person, friend watching this, you don't want to leave a comment on YouTube, you can send it to me in a private message. I'll be happy with that. And with this, I'm off. My next video will probably be a Dead Cells one. Dead Cells is a 2022 game for sure. Thanks for watching. Bye.